Thank you very much for all being here for our <coughs> second session uh, on old vines. Last time we covered the future value um, of the old vine category and we talked a little bit about the premiumizing effect of old vines. And today we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, and the overall purpose really today is to educate and sensitize audiences about the value of old vines across the entire value chain. Um, so I think it, it creates a unique story from uh, discussing with a, a lot of our panelists and discussants on today. Um, it really creates a, a unique and compelling story, uh, not only for, uh, for the for individual producers, but also for the country brand. And it can be taken from a lot of different perspectives. So we're going to look at three particular topics today. The first topic is the importance of the old vine category for primary and secondary production. And the second is how does the old vine category help to reinterpret other categories and how should we look at it as benefiting other categories within the South African uh, wine industry. And then thirdly, to look to, 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 to shine a focus on the trade, both on the off trade and on trade, and to really look at um, how it's, it's benefiting uh, both producers and retailers in that space and also then uh, the on-trade as well. So before, I, before we commence, I'd just like to ask uh, Andre Morgenthal to say a few words and then maybe a little bit from Lorraine as well. Andre, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and thank you very much for everyone participating today. Um, it's a big group and I think there's a lot of content to cover this afternoon, but I think it's very valuable um, to look after what we're talking about today. Um, uh, we, um, it's, I think we value the work that's been done by the researchers, um, and we'll learn about that, um, as we go along this afternoon and also, um, looking at, um, the old vine project where we started three and a half years ago and looking at where Rusa started 20 years ago by searching for this, I think, um, like we said la the, at the previous session, here we're sitting on a Friday afternoon with almost 200 people um, listening in uh, on the subject. I think it's very valuable to, to embrace this and try and understand how we're going to take this forward in its different facets. So um, thank you very much for the platform. Um, I would like to thank the UCT GSB and, and um, Lorraine Elsenberg. It all started with you guys with a class at Elsenberg and uh, it turned into a huge webinar, um, sort of a Letting this guy sort of thing with, with this lockdown situation. So, Lorraine, over to you and um, thank you. Well, Guys, we're welcome, wonderful. Rico. Yeah, welcome, Rico. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> for once, Jonathan, once again, I don't have much to say, except for I think it's a great opportunity that um, initially this started off as only for the final year students in cellar technology and cellar management that you are lecturing now at Alsenberg. And I think it's just a wonderful platform where we can open this to, to so, so many more people than only our students. So, so that is about it that I will be saying this afternoon. Thank you. It's great to have all, everyone here. Uh, I think also Andre wanted to give a special message to, to Rico. Um, and I'd like to thank him in particular for being here today, because I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't uh, attend a webinar like this on a day like today for him. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rico, uh, it's been quite a heavy couple of weeks for you, and I think um, it's we all appreciate what you guys have been doing for us, for the industry, um, representing us and pulling us out of stage four, and we can start selling wine um, next week, or, or not selling, but actually transporting and delivering. Um, but most of all, happy birthday, um, as, as Jonathan said. Um, <laughs> On a day like today that you sacrifice a Friday afternoon and your birthday, um, we appreciate your time and your effort uh, and your contribution. And uh, I would like to give some background on the, the image is the uh, image of a vehicle on the road, the, the, the road map for the wine industry that Rita initiated um, a few years ago called WISE, the Wine Industry Strategic Exercise. 
and we decided that that would be um, appropriate this afternoon to put him at the steering wheel because that's where he is. Thank you, Rico. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I see I've got a name change as Raffaella, but uh, no, it's a pleasure. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> Andre, Andre told me, look, it's uh, just join. It's a very relaxed conversation. So I'm glad to be here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think let's kick off. As I said, the first topic we really want to explore is we're going to go through the value chain and value chain is made up of demand and supply chains. And it's really um, looking at uh, exactly where value is created um, for, for an industry like, like wine. And obviously, this goes from the consumer exchange point right down to the nurseries and even to grape growers. So we want to unpack the primary and secondary pr production aspect. And um, to introduce the topic, um, I'd like to ask Rico to maybe just unpack for us um, what the implications are for the industry for retaining vineyards for grape growers. I know this is a complex issue. Um, and what are the importance of old vines for grape growers? Maybe you can just frame that for us from uh, with, with, with your sight of, 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 of that side of the industry. Thank mm -hmm. you, Rico. Jonathan, yeah, thank you. And I, I'm sorry I missed your introduction. But, but, but to me, I want to start off by saying... <laughs> When we talk about the wine industry, in my view, we talk about two, two industries in one. The first one I would call a generic industry. We talk about bulk production, high volume production. And the second one is the premium leg where, where I would think old vines fits in. But, but to me, before I get stuck in the production side, to me, what, what the old vine project did, it, it led to a evolution of thought as well. It, it made us think differently about three different points. There are more than that, but, but number one, the way we could elevate and position and premiumize, we, we, we needed something that can drive image, push the price because you can only farm, but unless you get the price element right, it's a struggle. The second thing it did is it led to thoughts on innovation and, and that led to precision farming, the thinking about site specific, um, the fact that it's an old vineyard doesn't mean it's gonna be a great wine. You need to have the site, the, the practices, the viticulture, the winemaking, and obviously back to Peter, who will talk about the market. It's actually the other way around. So a lot of thought about innovation and precision farming, not only in the project, but in the bigger, broader industry as well. And then the third leg, Jonathan, is the ROI. And, and, and I think, I think as a country, our biggest problem is that due to a number of things, um, our average lifespan of vineyards is only 20 years or even less. I mean, on the red varietals, they virus infected, they only get to 18 years, which, which is a challenge. And, and suddenly I think people realized that if you could get the lifespan up to 35, 40 years, like then uh, it balances out and it means that that 300,000 rand that you need to invest is, is phased out a little bit. So, so to me, probably that's where I stop. I think it shifted our mindset to think about um, old vines, but also the rest of the industry in the way we do things. Right, thank, thank you uh, for, for that perspective. Um, I'd like to now switch to Peter Cornier from UniWines. Um, and he can, he's embraced old vines from a producer seller, a very large uh, producer. So I'd like him to, to unpack this a little bit uh, from his perspective and also just share um, whether he thinks this niche category um, can be embraced by, by larger mainstream producers. So over to you, um, Peter. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, it's uh, great to see so many familiar and new faces. Um, yeah, for, for me, I've, I've said this to Andre a zillion times, um, the Old Vine Project is the most inclusive category that South Africa has established. Um, and you know, it, it, it's not fixated with a varietal, it's not fixated with an origin, it, it transcends size. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a it's a brilliant story to tell, and it's very inclusive. Um, Rico mentioned um, there's two worlds. Now I, I we operate in both worlds. Um, just to give you a, a sense of what we deal with, we we have three thousand contracted hectares, of which fifty hectares would classify as old vine, and only of the, that that fifty hectares we work with five hectares so coming coming back to not all that is old is good and we operate and i hope i don't get slated for all the terminology terminology i use but it's this terroir or let's call it site specific wine versus commodity wines or commercial wines and you know my i i i live and work in both and no one is less than the other one. They need both, they have different outputs, different inputs. Um, so yeah, we, we started off in 2014, uh, thanks to Rosa, when she had her I'm old website and I clicked on our area and I, I discovered a little um, Muscat block. I know Chris is using it as well, that dates back nine, to 1900. Um, and from that, you know, we started to be inquisitive. So what, what we are doing and what we are working with is what we have. So it's nothing new. It's part of our contracted um, hectares. Um, and I think the little bit that I can talk about is how you can coexist in both worlds in this, let's call it site specific old vine world, but also in the commodity commercial world. And I'm, I'm glad Victoria is also here because I think she operates in both as well. So on the commercial side, you know, majority of our 3000 hectares feeds into um, the retail sector, into big brands, into um, mass consumer um, products. Um, and there it's all about consistency, familiarity, international varietals, international styles, and then you put your site-specific OVP hat on, and then it's all about uniqueness, um, provenance, site, story. So it's, um, it's, it's complex. It, I, I must admit, we're learning every single day and we battle with the complexities of these two worlds because the, the input is, is very different. You work with farmers that are commercial farmers, um, whereas, <laughs> Um, I, I remember Eben mentioned two weeks ago with old vine, it's all about pruning um, to harness the grape or, or the vineyard and to salvage it and to nurture it. Whereas in a commercial environment, it's to prune for yield. So when you have a commercial farmer, they have two hats on. It's very different and it's very challenging. So for us, we, we looked at what is rare. Um, and we were looking at the rarity factor. So we, um, for instance, our claret block that Rosa has visited as well. Our first year we harvested 600 kilograms. Now I'll get to the commercials later. Um, uh, but you know, two, three years later, we, we have 1.7 tons from that hectare. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, it's not mass volume. It's not the 15 million liters that we produce, but it's three barrels. And it does, it does um, add to a, an image, um, a perception um, that helps us. It has a halo effect, but, but make no mistake, it's not easy for a big producer to um, have the craft image that you know, all the other um, brands um, would, would have. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, we, we operate in both worlds. We have commodity, a commodity hat on, which is needed. It's a different consumer, a different channel that it feeds into. And on the terroir site specific um, level, you know, we, we, it's about rarity, it's about story, it's, it's about provenance, um, and it's about honesty. And the, the, the commercial side is, it's a bit tricky. It's, um, it's a little bit different to say, for instance, you contract two tons of old vines or you contract um, five tons and you share it with other brands. The reality of a commercial 
company or setup like ourselves, the opportunity cost for the farmer is, is massive. So if he has a national title and he, he yields enough um, grapes, you know, he could have turnover of 100, 120, 150 behind a hectare. And you do the calculations at 1.7 tons for our carrot. It's probably the most expensive grapes in the industry. Um, but we do it because we, we, we want to do it. Um, and it has a purpose. And yeah, we, we're trying to, to um, harness the heritage and the stories. And I, I, in conclusion, it's not impossible. It's not impossible to have old vines within your um, big producer setups. Um, I, would, I would say not all old vines need to end up in an um, old vine uh, brand or skew. I, I remember um, the one panelist two weeks ago mentioned if you're not overpopulating this category, it loses its rarity, its perceived rarity. So I, I would like to put a question to the panel for later for discussion or input, but once um, marketers latch onto old vine project and the seal, um, it's, it might be detrimental to the category. So it's a, how, you, how you manage that um, without being too exclusive, it's, it's something we battle with as well. Okay, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, if I can just ask the other panelists just to mute, um, uh, it's, it's just like an administration um, uh, matter. If you would like to, thank you very much for all your questions. We were inundated with questions before the session. So hopefully we'll be able to de uh, deal with it. For those who want to just ask some questions, just pop it in the Q&A. And uh, mark it, if it's for a specific person, just mark it for them, or you can direct it directly to them. Or if it's a general question, please uh, put it in the Q&A and we'll pick it up and hopefully we can, we can deal with it. Thank you, Peter. So I think um, just to seg onto that, and, and someone asked, well, what's the difference between primary and secondary production? So hopefully Rico won't correct me, but I, I believe primary production is where the, 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 the original grapes are, are are grown and, and um, secondary production is obviously where the wine is made. So there might be slight differences and, and obviously Peter and Rico, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But I'd like to now, uh, I went to a seminar a few years back that Chris Arlight did and he had quite a lot to, to share about uh, the relationship between the grower and the winemaker and the importance of sustainability. It's all fine and well to charge a lot of money for your old vine and wine, but it's as equally important that that value created at the point of exchange feeds back into grower sustainability. And as we said in the beginning, last uh, last session, uh, last session we had was sustainability starts with getting the right price for your vi wine and grapes. So, so just to to talk a little bit about that, I'd like to welcome Chris. Chris, thanks very much for being here today. Hey guys, thank you for having me. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, just please excuse my voice. I've, I've been a bit sick, so I'm, I'm, I sound pretty dodgy. Um, Peter, yeah, just some really excellent points you made there. Um, and something I'd like to latch on to is that the, the, the whole OVP thing, I think is a great opportunity for, for the two sides of the industry that you mentioned to really hold hands, you know, and take the whole narrative forward. Um, because we, we, we can't live in two separate worlds. Um, obviously, you and I have chatted quite a bit uh, prior to this. Um, yeah, I love the points that you made. Um, the, the thing that I'd like to talk about, and I probably won't even need five minutes to do it, if that's okay, <clears throat> is just what I would call like a cultural shift amongst wineries. Kind of wineries, sort of our size, we're about a 100 ton producer. Um, and there are more and more of those cropping up every year. So. Obviously, we're still an industry very much um, dominated by large producers uh, from a volume perspective, and that's fine. But there, there are there are more small producers every year, and I think what I want to talk about is is a, is a cultural is a cultural thing. Um, what the culture is amongst wineries, because what we're coming out of because of our because of our recent history, the last few decades, is is a is a cooperative farming mentality, which is farming for for tons, farming for yield. I don't think anyone could 
could reasonably argue with that. Um, so that's defined the majority of our, of, our, of our industry culture for the last 40 or 50 or how many, I don't know, 100 years. Um, and there, there are obviously exceptions to that. So I think the, the, the time we're living in now, and that's what makes this Alvine project so intriguing, um, it's definitely a time of, of change, of cultural shift. So th the one thing that I want to touch on is, is the risk of old vineyards, because anyone involved with, with intimately involved with old vineyards knows that there's risk. Peter was mentioning the claret that cost him so much. Um, I know David has had run-ins with expensive grapes. We, 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 we've never had a vintage where we didn't have at least something you know, equivalent of, of 60 to 100,000 rand a ton every year that we've, we've worked. That might seem shocking, but it's, you know, I've got, I've got my costs here next to me. I'll, I'll read them out later on, just as an example. So what I want to say is that with old vineyards, there's risk and somebody has to take the risk. And if you look at the whole proposition, let's say we've fulfilled the proposition, the truth proposition that old vineyard wine is a little bit deeper and more complex and, and, maybe culturally a little more relevant, um, that it fulfills all of those propositions to the consumer, okay? Let's say we've ticked that box. So now we've offered the, the person in the UK or wherever, we've offered them a slightly better bottle of wine. Um, that, that's fulfilled. Now, from a business proposition, who's making the money? Now, I'm going to tell you, it's not the farmer in most cases. And that's the problem. If we want to talk about sustainability of old minutes, <clears throat> we've got absolutely no hope of achieving that if we don't start taking a lot of the risk off the farmer and letting the wineries who are making the actual profit take on the risk. So that is, that's the gospel that needs to be preached. We need to get much closer to something like Mondavi was proposing in Napa Valley all those years ago where you're the, the hundred times multiplier, let's say you're selling a bottle of wine and you're making 200 rand, you should be paying about 20 grand a ton for your grapes. Something like that. I'm not being um, prescriptive, but I am saying that, um, if the farmer is forced to take the risk every year of, of, of getting a one ton a hectare yield and losing money or getting two tons a hectare or three tons a hectare and breaking even, why on earth would he carry on doing it? It makes absolutely no sense. And then the, the, the 28 year old winemaker goes and gets a, a five star in Pato or something like that. And he thinks he's the, the greatest thing since, since sliced bread. You know, th there's, a, there's a total imbalance there. So people need to understand that they're part of a whole, that they're part of an industry and that the farmers obviously just Bear in mind, I'm speaking from a, from a negotiant um, small winery who buys grapes type of perspective. I guess that's really the only perspective I can, um, I can offer because that's what we are. Although recently we've become farmers, so I do have a little bit more of an of a insight there now. But what I want to say is the risk needs to be taken on by the winery because the wineries are the ones that, that, that can stand to, to, to make more profit. If, if a farmer has a good year, he's making 40, 50% profit. Um, you know, where if a, if a guy is, is let's look at this for a second. If I pay, if I pay 25, if I pay 20 grand a ton for grapes and I conservatively get 720 bottles out of a ton, and that's roughly what you get. If you're pressing quite lightly, you're looking after quality, uh, you're getting about that. You, you can get as many as 800 bottles out of a ton, but we don't get that many. So conservatively at 720 bottles out of a ton, you can do the sums. That's 27 rand a bottle at 20 grand a ton. If you jump it up to 30 grand a ton, it's 41 rand a bottle. 35 grand a ton is almost 50 rand a bottle. So we spend 50 bucks a bottle on some of our packaging for our single vineyard wines. They get wrapped in a bit of paper. They come in a wooden box, which adds about 16 rand a bottle. Understand, so what kind of world, it doesn't make any sense where our grapes are less valuable than, than, than the bottle and the cork and the capsule that they come in. For goodness sake. So I just would like to say, you know, I can't offer any real numbers and figures and solutions, but I would say we need a call for a cultural shift amongst wineries that are benefiting from, from the, the inherent quality in old vineyards, you know, to be able to step up to the plate and say, okay, <clears throat> you know, let's rather go into a per hectare agreement where the farmer is safe, where he knows that he's going to get what he needs to get. You know, even if he's not making a terrific amount of money, it has to be sustainable for him. Um, yeah, it just seems to be a, an inequality that's built into the game and maybe that is shifting now um and just just for a bit of perspective i mean you know our, our most expensive grapes this year came in at 93 grand a ton um our second most expensive was 63 grand a ton and then below that we were hovering around 20 to 24 grand a ton for everything 
And that's the reality. That's what it costs. We've got um, the fantastic Shannon from Nivelland, where they charge us, I think, 11 grand a ton. And that's by far our cheapest grapes. Um, and I think they're worth more, and I've argued with them about it, but you get some farmers that just are stuck in that, in that thing. And so um, I understand that what I'm saying doesn't apply to the whole industry, but uh, you know, I'm here to speak of, about my small part of the industry. So that, that's what I can add. Um, I don't thanks. know where I am on my five minute time limit, probably close. Thanks, thanks Chris, brilliant. And uh, thanks for answering, I think, what Rod Phillips um, asked. Um, he, he said, uh, to what extent is the old vine project motivated by the sense that old vines are worth protecting simply that because they're old? The fact that the word heritage is used su suggests a cultural more than enological motivation in preserving wi uh, vines. So we, we'd like to cycle back on that. And I've got another question from Tim Atkin. So if we can just uh, hand over to David uh, Sardi uh, briefly. And just to unpack from his side, talking a little bit about the boundaries around the certification, because it can, it can be quite tricky if you've got vine mortality um, and you have to interplant. And this is what uh, Eben was talking about. And I think um, uh, David's got quite an interesting perspective on this. So, so David, over to you. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Hope you guys can hear me clearly. Um, I think, yeah, Chris, um, Peter, uh, Rico, I think spot on to, to have a good uh, platform for the discussion. Um, I think the reality that came with the Old Vine project has really been a cultural and a character shift. Uh, I think we can have a discussion for many days about price points in terms of are we watering down the OVP, uh, let's say, as a brand or as a niche by having a lot of like big producers coming on board. I think it's spot on to have those producers on board because it's important to have high end, let's say top focus wines, but it's also important to have those foot soldiers. And I think if, as, as long as you bottle something and you put your pride into it, I think that's the most important part of it. Um, I mean, Andre Morgenthal and myself, we've had many discussions about the regulations around, let's say 15% of the final wine that you're allowed to blend um, and I think it, it goes hand in hand with the current discussion in terms of the character of the old vine project or the character of the producer, uh, the culture around farming. Um, I think this whole, let's say, movement has, has really led to, uh, call it a revolution in terms of the way we think about vineyards. Vineyards that initially were planted for 18 or 20 years down the line to be uplifted or uprooted. Um, the, the, let's say the bad material we started with, um, I think it all contributes to the final answer in terms of it's the shift of culture by means of, of quality that's been the main driver around the old vine project. The seal that authenticates that, um, that we all go towards a, a, a way of thinking around, we're not gonna neglect our vignettes anymore like in the past, regardless of the reason why. Um, no longer do we just um, not interplant. We're discussing these things, it's really relevant topics. Uh, in terms of the Salvas and Wine and Spirit Board, in terms of declarations around a, city, uh, a single vineyard or not. Um, and I think that we can't just assume, like uh, many people have said before, that an old vine will give you greatness or that will give you the best final wine. So I think the, the culture shift that's gone towards, we plant for the future, we plant to, to, for something that grows old. I mean, to give you a bit of perspective, we farm a lot of old vineyards. Um, we don't own them, we would love to buy them in the future, that's part of our dreams. And then also we involve with a couple of old vines and we've moved towards a hectare price. So there's a sustainability part of that that comes in. And I think that needs, and it touches on with what Chris Allard said, we need to see that across the industry. Uh, and it's a big challenge and it's obviously questions that people don't want to answer or they don't want to have those questions on the table. Um, you can have discussions around prescriptive farming and we've got our own vision around it, but I think the sustainable part of the vineyard and the farmer that needs to make a margin, he needs to, to, to be able to, let's say, interplant to upkeep the vineyard and make sure that vineyards becomes old. And if you have an existing old vineyard that's already neglected, we need to do something about it. Um, so for me, I think if we were from day one planting vineyards and every year we were planting, young vines in 
we would not have a situation where we have 50, 60% dead vines in existing vineyards. So that's a cultural shift, which is I think what has been brought uh, onto the, the table and the character that came out of the old vine project is to make sure that we do discuss these things. And I think Vine and Spirit Sport needs to buy into this. And I think if you think of, I mean, we've got a few vineyards that got 65, 70% dead vines. I mean, Worstian as an example, it's a two hectare vineyard. There's 2,500 vines approximately in that vineyard. So coming down to farming costs, a price per ton, a bad vintage, a good vintage, it's, it's expensive. But at the end of the day, if you think of the integrity around, um, first of all, the information on the table, if you think of Salvage One, which is the official documentation, that's integrity of the farmer to make sure he's really, um, he's been honest about what's, what's planted. The integrity of the winemaker to, if he uses 15% as a blending or as a scapegoat, I don't know what to call it, um, but if he uses that 15%, is he doing it with the integrity? Is he doing it with honesty or is he not blending 30 or 50% of different wines or different um, vine ages? Um, so whether you use 15% as a wine, let's say, uh, criteria or interplanting, I think it's about the final product that needs to be the best. We need to interplant, we need to start, I mean, as soon as we can, financially, we need to make sure that these vineyards are, are kept up to good standards so we can farm them efficiently going forward. Um, prices per vine or per ton will come down because of this. Um, and, and whether or not you include younger vineyards from day one or not, it's about, again, the proof is in the pudding. The, the, the market will decide for himself if you infuriated a wine by blending in something bad. Because at the end of the day, if you think of a solar system or uh, an approved certification system, it's as good as the honesty of any winemaker. So in our cellars, we can do what we want uh, right. in theory. So, um, sorry, can I keep, should I finish off or? Jonathan? Yeah, can you, can you wrap up? So we can, I just want to get to a round table. Thanks, David. Okay, sure. So to summarize, I think it's important uh, that the seal resembles uh, honesty, authenticity, and there's also a holistic approach around farming, not just the farmer, but also the holistic view around specific, if you think of poverty, if you think of our background, if you think of our history in our country, we need to address those situations. And I think the OVP seal needs to stand for something where they know the whole process has gone through a proper uh, authentic system where from ground worker up to the winemaker and everyone in between is really being looked after. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. Uh, I'm sure um, it would be great to unpack that more and maybe there's an opportunity in the future to talk more about this, this really important and riveting topic. But I'd like to just ask the panel as a whole, I've got quite a lot of questions, but I think um, the, the one maybe to, to start with, to cycle back to Rico, maybe to talk a little bit about the culture of ripping up vineyards and the culture of needing to... Uh, to preserve vineyards that are worth preserving. Uh, how do we change that culture? And maybe you can just come back and say, well, well, what is the difference between primary and secondary production? And how does it start also in the nursery? And then maybe a, a question also to the panel from Tim Atkin is, and Andre said he can also answer this. Does anyone know the percentage of the country's old vines uh, in cooperative hands? And then the third question from Louis Jacques, in, in Montreal is, is, hi Greg, uh, is hi there. about what are, we, what are we doing to highlight the growers? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's often the brands that become, um, become uh, prominent and the personalities behind the brands, but are we helping to, to showcase the growers of the grapes? So Rico, mm -hmm. if you want to kick off. I think, Jonathan, firstly, I think you've, you've uh, given the definition of primary and secondary very well. We've, we've got about 3,000 growers on the primary side. They farm about 90,000 hectares. Um, and I would say primary is grapes and secondary is processing. Um, yeah, I, I almost want to make a statement in that is that if you look back, the industry is old. It's 360 plus years old, but we've only been in the back in the global space of what, about 30 years. And I, you can break that up into five, seven year cycles. And we've played a bit of catch up. 
the the one thing that we don't talk talk about is um, is the quality of our planting material, and uh, I'm glad that David and I think Chris, you've alluded to the the systems. We've got brilliant, brilliant systems, but we've also got brilliant world class in plant improvement companies like Vititech. Who's, who's got clonal gardens, who's done this brilliantly since the early or the late 1970s. And uh, I need to say something about Shin and Ina because you are here. Um, <laughs> and, and I think what has happened and what is exciting when we talk um, alignment and focus, mm. and, and Peter and myself has got debates about cultivar spread. Should it be Bordeaux focus deep? Should it be wide? I personally think when we talk about innovation, we, we tend to go too wide. We tend to think innovation on new things. While I would say innovation with old vines is exactly what's happening. We, we look at selections of Chenin Blanc, and Ina can talk to that. Uh, three, four, five years ago, we started to do selections. We've cleaned them up, and, and in three years' time, we will have commercial virus-free, brilliant material who can start playing to our strength. And when we combine then precision farming, longevity, um, and we integrate the chain, I mean, Jonathan, that is exciting. But, but what we need to get right are two things. We are in a long-term industry with sometimes very short-term erratic behavior, which, which is difficult and it's frustrating. It's driven by profitability. But secondly, if you ask me about the phase, I do think we are entering already the phase of consolidation where these growers and the off takers and the brands are coming together also in ownership. And I think it's much needed because it's just too fragmented. So um, the, the decision to uproot or not is not only about wine profitability, it's obviously also uh, other other agricultural industries competing for the same hectare. But there is a change, and I think we need to back ourselves on the research and the cultivar focus, and uh, we need to make that investment even bigger. So I'm not exactly answering your question, but I want to emphasize the importance of quality material focus playing to the strength. Great, thank you, Rico. Um, okay, just a quick snap because we, we're running a little bit long on time. So just, uh, Peter, if you can maybe say, do you know what percentage or Andre come in uh, of old vines are in, uh, in the hands of cooperative or previous cooperative producer sellers? And then Butch and David, a quick snap on um, changing the culture around, uh, around um, old vines. Peter? So um, about just under 4% of our total plantings is old vines, 35 years and older. So um, 90,000 90, hectares planted, 3,500 hectares roughly old vines, and 85% of the old vines tied up in the um, producer seller or the cooperative systems, which was the biggest challenge for us to, to unlock. Um, and as Jonathan, as you said earlier, Peter uh, and Dasbosch, Univines, they, they realized the potential very early. Um, it took a few years to convince the other uh, producer sellers, and we've got five as members now and very actively um, taking part. Thanks. Uh, a quick word from Peter and, uh, and David and Chris. Maybe we're going to bring you in um, again in the next session. So a quick word from you, Peter. Um, well, I can just concur what David and, and Chris said about um, commercials and, you know, we pay a per hectare price. And, and I think maybe it didn't come through in my little bit, but, you know, we, we are confronted with opportunity costs. So if, if somebody understands that when they farm a block to the left or to the right, they, they look at what they potentially earn uh, there and they want to replicate it on an old wine block as well. So we pay a per hectare price, and I suspect they, um, Chris does the same. Um, so it takes a hell of a lot of risk, and it maybe make it a little bit more difficult for, for people to latch onto it. Um, but it, you, know, you make a commitment, um, and most of you know, our producers are in a long-term 
um, you know, evergreen contracts. So you can't just trial something and then move on. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the other point I just want to make, and it's something even um, mentioned last time, is the fine wine market. Old wine needs to feed into fine wine market. You know, it's, it's no point in flocking it for five quid or six quid. Um, and the fine wine market is, is not infinite. So um, to convert whatever the, the old wine hectares is in South Africa all to, to a bottle and feed it into a fine wine market, there, there's, there might be an overpopulated um, category then. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, uh, uh, Butch and da uh, David, I'm going to bring the question in uh, after the, the next uh, session um, for you to maybe come in and segue nicely between what we're talking about in terms of category reinterpretation and then the value proposition in the trade. So, uh, I'll involve you in that, but I think we need to move on to the next topic or the next pasture, as I call it. So just to, to briefly sketch some of the research that we're doing on the market side, and we, we're engaged in quite a lot of research on old vines um, and the marketability and value of it in the markets. And we've just published uh, an, an article um, uh, on the, the value of the old vine queue. So a queue is, is basically a claim that's underpinned by a category or an attribute um, and it's, it's, it communicates to consumers something of value in a, a bottle of wine. So uh, the ex extrinsic cue is different from an intrinsic cue, which are sensory characteristics, which Astrid uh, is going to talk a little bit about what inside the bottle um, uh, signals to consumers or indicates that something is an old vine or not. But it's quite specific on a wine bottle on the label. It will either say old vines on the front or the back. And the sum total of a wine's price, or this is the theory, is made up of, of the sum total of the value of all these cues on the bottle, or all these signals on the bottle. So the words old vine on the front label or the certified heritage seal, those all have values and the total sum of those extrinsic cues uh, equals the wine price. And we found that for every year that a vine was in the ground, it added 2 rand 96 to a bottle of wine. And uh, we were able to segment the old vine category uh, quite nicely. And the average price point, um, this is 2017-18 data before the seal appeared, um, was around 310 rand. And we expect that to be a lot more now. In fact, we, we, uh, we're embarking on more data collection now. And um, also the amount of, of cues on wine bottles that say either on the front label, back label, or via the seal has proliferated in, incredibly over the last two years. So we're seeing really significant growth in what we call a nascent category. So this is a young category that has started to form. Um, and uh, it's interesting that certain cues, uh, in combination with old vines, had high value. So, so for example, uh, Pinotage had a very high value. We didn't find a significance in Shannon, but we, we expect that might grow. And I'm going to explain that very briefly just now. Um, but, but interestingly enough, we found that uh, old vine cues signaled on the back label, that means when old vines were mentioned on the back label, were significant, had significantly greater value than when sig uh, signal on the front label. Because at that s stage, there was no seal. And we expect that's going to change dramatically as well. So we asked some questions around Shannon and the country brand of South Africa. We talked a little bit about that. And how important Old Vines is to reinterpret, for example, the Shannon Blanc category or reinterpret the country brand. So, for example, a good example is Grappa, which was always suffered from low status. And they tried and failed to elevate the status of the Grappa brand. And uh, Nonino Grappa uh, managed to actually do it at one stage to elevate the status and value of Grappa because they detached it, they detached themselves from the the uh, grappa category and try to align themselves with luxury spirit category. Now that's a, an, a, a, an example of decoupling. 
uh, there's also to, to merge into another category. So if, if Shannon Blanc is, for example, taking uh, old vines, which we did some uh, netnographic studies and we did some qualitative analysis on a bunch of, of media articles on both Shannon Blanc and old vine. And we found that old vines had a very high status in the market, uh, or at least amongst that uh, online community. Whereas Shannon globally, it's not just a South African thing, is, is, suffers from a bit of stigmatization. So we wonder whether the coupling old vines with Shannon, uh, because 53% of the old vineyards are Shannon Blanc, and South Africa um, ha has 53% of the world's Shannon uh, vineyards. So it's really important for South Africa. And, and without going into too many specific details, I'd like to sort of push that question towards Inna and ask her, well, how important is old vines for uh, improving the status and value for Shannon Blanc producers and for the South African Shannon category and possibly for the global Shannon Blanc category? Inna, over to you. Let me unmute myself. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, Jonathan, um, to answer you, for the CBA, the allure of, of the old vine category um, for the CBA started 21 years ago. And that was, um, I read up the inaugural um, CBA Association meeting, which was, which was held in October 1999. And I'd like to quote for you, um, the most important issue that needs to be addressed is the evalu evaluation of the very old Shannon vineyards, some of them which are in immediate danger being uprooted to make way for trendier and currently better paying varieties. And that was October 99, 20 years ago. Um, when I joined the CBA as manager in 2009, um, one of the first projects I was involved with uh, was a project in which Ken Forrester wanted to give recognition um, to the people who own specific old block uh, vineyards. And he described them as the custodians of some of the greatest material in this country. Um, Exco member Kali Kutsia tried to track down um, some of the oldest blocks in the country. And I think Rosa, you'll um, um, respect this. It took him 10 months um, to do that. Um, because some of the Shannon vineyards, which were in the Salvas records as Shannon, was obviously not Shannon. In um, our AGM in, in 2009, um, we gave certificates to these custodians. And I'd just like to mention two of these um, custodians, which was, of course, the Mrs. Kirsten vineyard, um, for Kirsten, and then also Dani. I don't think it was you, Dani, uh, Junior. I think it was your dad who um, accepted this custodian. Um, uh, Danny, you know, I, I, two, I was back here, 2009, I just started on this farm. And uh, I remember that very clearly. Is it? Okay, wonderful. So <laughs> thank you for confirming. I was thinking about that. So um, that was great. Um, and I think another important development um, for Shannon and Old Vine was the research project which was started 10 years ago in 2009 with a um, support, wonderful support of, of Wine Tech and under supervision of um, Dr. Helene Nuvot of the Stalabashvi at University. Astrid will talk about that um, a bit later, but the one research subject um, which was very important and which I was very involved in was 2000 and 2015 by MSc student um, Renee Cross. Um, and um, as there was no official classification of old vines at that stage, we worked with old vines that were 40 years and older. We wanted to make sure it's really good um, old vines. And one of the outcomes of that research um, was the identification of typical old vine taste profile, which again Astrid will um, elaborate it on. Um, and then, Jonathan, um, another support for Old Vine, I think, um, to keep it short, 
um, was the first international Chilean Congress, which were held in um, Andre um, last um, year in, in July. Um, Andre did two presentations on the Old Vine project, and of course you did one on um, exploring the on-demand status of South African Old Vine with um, Shannon Cues. Um, and just to summarize, I think the Shannon Blanc Association have acknowledged the inherent value um, of old vines on several levels um, for the producer, um, the quality, um, the price. And this is something that we will we had support in future. Um, so for the future, we will continue networking, supporting and sharing information um, of the old vine project. It's been a journey of 21 years. Um, I think I'm near retirement age at this stage but definitely it will, it will continue. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Inna. And what a privilege it was to be with uh, fellow Chenin Blanc lovers and uh, interested people at that conference last year. What a wonderful experience. Um, so just to segue yeah. to Astrid, talk was, a little bit about... Was, it... Sorry, Inna. I just wanted to mention it was a truly a highlight, the conference. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Inna. Over to you, Astrid, talking about the sensory characteristics of old vine wines. Um, what have you found in your research and what does the future research look like? Uh, are there any difference in the ser in intrinsic sensory characteristics of old vines? Hello everybody. Um, I don't think a lot of people know me. Um, I made this joke before, but I, I think it's worth saying it again. They don't really let me out of the lab very often, except for sometimes going to conferences. Um, I am a relatively newcomer in the, in the old vine research because of course the, the gate was opened by, by Helian. But I'm really happy to speak after Ina because, in fact, it is due to the Shenin Blanc Association that most of um, our projects have happened. Um, it is uh, old vine Shenin Blanc is 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 for us quite a um, how can I say a source of wonder because it doesn't really fit into the categories that we are very used to uh, to research. So on one hand, um, of course, number wise, there are much more new vine or young vine uh, wines on the market. So of course, already the old vine is a more an exclusive club, but also the wines themselves from, from our perspective are really, really special because uh, this particular project, which was very extensive that uh, Ina has mentioned that Rene has done, um, started by looking at the aroma and then moved on to the mouthfeel because the um, aroma is something for us much easier to, to evaluate. We have standards, we can train the panelists, the, the aromas are, tend to be quite consistent between, um, between the wines as in which aromas, not necessarily uh, particularly for a specific wine. Um, but the mouthfeel is what made the difference for, the, for, for our research because on one hand it gave us the opportunity to develop this in-mouth or mouthfeel taste related uh, characteristics of the old vine which completely uh, are completely different from the young vine wines. But also, so it's an opportunity for development but also for investigation. Now, uh, related to the question of whether the old vine wines are really different from the young vine wines, there are different perspectives. Um, and we have done some research on that as well. It is, of course, not as straightforward because you cannot really take a bunch of old vine shenin, let's say, and young vine shenin and put them against each other because one category has much, I mean, has few members while the other one the, the, uh, the Chenin Blanc, the general Chenin Blanc category has so much diversity. But generally what René has found is that the attributes, so the aroma um, attributes are very similar, but the way they manifest are very different. The wines are much more complex, the old vine wines are much more complex, but also much more subtle. So 
maybe they lack a bit of this vibrancy, but they definitely compensate for that with integration and concentration and body and complexity. So it's not a matter of give and take, it's a matter of really the old vine chain in blank. It's, I, to me, it, it really tends to be its own style. And what I can tell you from other research that, that we have done is that you cannot really pinpoint it just to the grapes. There is a really complex phenomenon that is happening, you know, from the vineyard all the way to the winemaking to, to contribute towards this style. But also for me, what I really, really like, and I am not part of the industry, guys, I think I made three wines in my entire life and they were not drinkable. They were for, uh, you know, research purposes, is that you have to value what you have. You, you have to treat the grapes for the, the how can I say, for what they are, they are rare, they are precious. So I think from the point of view of me as a consumer, I am willing to pay more if what comes with that old vine or with the certified heritage label is really well connected to what's in the bottle. I don't, I really do not want to buy a bottle with the expectations of an old vine heritage seal. And then you open it and you said, well, you know, it could be just any wine. So I think this is a great opportunity to, to promote the product. And we are always um, willing to help because I have worked a lot and we have worked a lot on, on Chenin Blanc, but there are Pinotage old um, vineyards and there are since old vineyards. So we would really, really like to expand based on, of course, on all the knowledge that we could gather um, from, the, from the Chenin Blanc. Thank you, Astrid. That sounds, that sounds like really exciting work and I, I look forward to hearing about it more. We've got a little old vine research group uh, so <laughs> which uh, we're trying to get going. Um, so maybe Rico, uh, I'm going to let Rico go to enjoy the rest of uh, his birthday. Um, so Rico, thanks very much for joining us. A last little word from you. No, no, thank you. I mean, I, uh, I made a note up front here to actually congratulate the whole project for what it's achieved. I think it's much more than, uh, and, it, and it's really shifted minds and, and it shifted uh, mindsets. So thank you, uh, Jonathan and, and everybody for the invite. It's always, always great to listen and learn from other people. Rico, have a lovely birthday further and thanks for what you're doing for the industry at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Um, okay, now we're going to segue into our third uh, pasture um, and we'll try and feed back to um, David and Butch. And then I've also got a question that I'd maybe like to get Rosa just to talk a little bit about. Uh, it's something I've been wondering about and it's, it's, a, it's a broader question, so we'll also segue into that. But the third pasture that I really wanted to get to was... Uh, what's the value proposition in the trade? You know, if there's no value at, at this point, and a lot of my research is, is focused a lot on this, but it's, it's always better to hear uh, real life case examples and also from people who deal every day, either in the on trade or off trade, what is the value of the old vines? Is there a growing perception that this is a valuable category? So just, to start off, I'd like to invite Dani and Victoria Mason from Waitrose. Thanks so much for being here uh, today. Um, it's really, I think a lot of people will benefit from your insight. Just talk a little bit about what you've been up to uh, in Waitrose uh, regarding old vines. Over to you, Victoria and Dani. Okay, thanks so much, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. I think um, Dani's delegated this part to me <laughs> um, in terms of talking about it, obviously, from a retail perspective. Um, so I'm just going to really briefly give um, an introduction to Waitrose and how that sits within the UK retail space um, for, for the audience that are perhaps less familiar with that. Um, and then I'll get into the detail of what we've been up to with Capsi Clipbrook. So um, Waitrose is a, a premium supermarket, um, it has a more affluent uh, customer base within the UK and it has a customer um, who tells us is, uh, they're very engaged in wine and, and we see this in terms of our, so our average bottle price is 33% higher than the average bottle price in the UK. 
Um, we're responsible for about 8% um, of the market in the supermarket sector. So um, around about the third of a, a third of the size of say Tesco. Um, and my South African range it similarly shares a market share of between 7.9 and 8.2%, depending on what activity we've got on. Um, in terms of, of sort of what we stand for as a retailer, we've always been a food-led retailer um, with a real focus on quality, provenance and farming standards. Um, and that culture flows through into our wine buying philosophy um, and is one of the reasons why I was so interested, I've been so interested in the Oat Vine project from, from early on. Um, so the wine that we're talking about today um, and why I was invited to, to attend is uh, the Capsule Clip Brook Chenin Blanc, um, which I listed two years ago, so um, the 2017 vintage. Um, and following conversations uh, last August, I think it was Danny, um, in, in the vineyard at Capsic with both Danny and with David Cartwright from Stepford, um, we decided that we would take the steps um, to get the Clipbrook Shannon certified um, and from the 2019 vintage uh, it will actually carry the certified Heritage Vineyard seal um, so it will be on Waitrose shelves later this summer. So why is the Heritage Vineyard seal um, important to me and important to Waitrose? On the simplest level and it's something we've talked about both in this webinar and previous webinar, it, it's a point of difference within both the South African um, range and the wider Waitrose range. And as such, it differentiates us from our competitors. Um, but it's, and I think this is the key point, it's, it's, a, it's a real and meaningful point of difference. Um, and years ago when I was a trainee buyer, I remember being taught to, to seek out point of difference, not pointless difference. And that that search um, that search really starts with the quality of the product, and, and that's where it started with Capsic Clipbrook. Um, the reason why I listed the wine was because it was a wonderful, expressive, textured wine. All of those sort of intrinsic qualities we've talked about with regard to old vines. Um, and only later did we, did we then have that discussion about um, actually the vines were planted in 1982 by Danny Senior, um, and they were potentially eligible for the seal. So for me, what the seal has the potential to communicate and to signpost to uh, the customer, the waitress shopper, um, is that quality piece first and foremost, um, the integrity uh, and authenticity that we've talked about, traceability. And then even wider than that, it's the, the community and the culture aspect. Um, and all of these all of these kind of multifaceted sides, they, they add up to giving um, the waitress shopper a really compelling reason to spend more on a bottle of wine and specifically on a bottle of Capsic Shenin. Um, so in the supermarket space particularly, I think that the power of the seal is, um, is really important because we know that shoppers don't spend that much time in front of the wine fixture. They make decisions fairly rapidly um, and this, this is a tool to help them navigate. Um, and um, in, in what is a quite a busy crowded fixture, it's something that can hone them in and offer something different. And I think once we've built up the awareness and the familiarity with what the seal designates, um, it can become a really powerful sales tool for us. Um, but we have to get to that place, that place of awareness um, with the customer. And I think that, again, looking at the business that I represent, we are quite uniquely placed within the UK supermarket sector to communicate what the Oprime project is about um, and what that certified heritage vineyard seal, what that means, what actually tell the story of that vineyard. Um, so we have, uh, we have WSET trained specialists in store who can convey that message verbally. Um, we have our own print publications which are heavily focused on food and drink. Um, so we can, we can use that as a, as a method of communicating. Um, and then we've got Waitrose Seller, which is our online specialist um, wine shop. So again, another platform for content. So I'm looking at all of this and I'm starting with the seal on the Capsic Clip Brook Shenin. And, and if we can employ that seal and a communication strategy of all those three channels, then ultimately what we've got the potential to do is significantly drive the sales of what in a supermarket sense is a premium um, Chenin Blanc in this case, but premium wine. And this is just the beginning. It, it's, it's one wind in the range and Danny and I are super excited to see it on shelves um, later this year. But, but for me personally as a buyer, I see this as 
as the start of something really exciting and something that I'd want to build on um, and um, yeah, and communicate to our customers. I don't know if Danny wants to add anything. <laughs> yeah, no, no, of course. Come, Danny, um, yeah, uh, you're up I, just I, to, to, um, to, to share your experience. Thanks. Uh, well, well, it's nice to be here and nice to see all my friends and colleagues in the wine industry. I think uh, uh, Butchie also touched on it earlier, saying this cultural shift. Um, you know, everyone that's, that's sitting here in front of me on the screen has, has been working towards what, what Andres now actually just finally seems to have achieved. Um, Arosa has been working on it for years. The winemakers are trying to push quality wines. Um, the Elsenberg University, um, Astrid doing a little projects. Everyone's trying to push the quality uh, of wine up. Um, the way we need to change the, the perception or the, the culture, I think, is with the bias. Uh, I often find that we doing back somersaults to try and farm these old vineyards, try and make the best possible wine, but we just don't have the people to buy the product. Peter Russo said that at the end, you know, that fine wine market where people are willing to pay a lot of money for really good wine, that's, that's a very small market. And um, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm very chuffed that the Waitrose and Victoria has taken, taken the step forward to say, look, we, we're keen to support this project. We, we are keen to buy and pay slightly more for something that's really good. And and hopefully we'll hopefully the people will buy it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Th thanks a lot, Dani. Maybe Butch, you want to come in here before we we um, we move to to Greg to share uh, maybe his side from uh, from a fine wine uh, retail in the UK. Um, Butch. Um, yeah, just quickly, <clears throat> just latching on to. Um, you know, the, the results of, of Astrid's work and, um, you know, what Victoria said, I think from my side, it has to be a quality proposition that's met. And so if it's, a, if the OVP thing symbolizes quality, that expectation has to be met. So I just, I mean, I'm sure we'll get to that point in the discussion later, but I think I'd like to bring it up is that, you know, the risky part here is that as this thing um, gathers, gathers steam, which it will, as, as as Victoria said, we in the still in the beginning of this thing. Um, you know, the exposure, the risk is that is that it'll be diluted by people putting poor wines into a bottle with the OVP sticker. So I don't know how on earth we're going to control that. But it's at there's, there's if it's just going to be an honesty is the best policy type of thing. But yeah, that I would say is is important for us to look at. And then as Donny said, cultural shift. You know, I, I just I think we need to stop with the with the Yani Yamarhat thing of of always thinking that our wines aren't worth what other countries' wines are worth. Um, we've got to stop that absolutely, but it's it's a very difficult line to walk because we need the commodity wine industry and we need the fine wine industry and we need to find a way of holding hands, uh, and maybe the OVP is a great way for us to do that. Uh, I think I've probably said enough. Brilliant point, Chris, and and I think Lorraine and I talked a little bit about I think what came out Michael Frigid last week was also the 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 great importance of education, education uh, for younger winemakers and and marketers entering the trade. I think um, so that we can, we can eliminate these ethical concerns, especially as far as quality is concerned. So a good point made there. And then over to Greg. Greg, thanks a lot for, for joining us in this discussion. Uh, and, I, um, and maybe you can just share your perspective on the old vine category from the fine wine retail perspective in the UK. Hi guys, uh, good to see you all. Um, sorry, I was a bit late into it. But um, uh, can you all hear me fine? Does it sound good? Great. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I've been in the unique position of it being in a very specific category, the same company dealing in fine wine for 20 years. So I've been able to, I haven't started at a Majestic or a Oddbins and then moved up to a supermarket and then got an MW and then moved into kind of fine wine, which is great because I've been in the same spot dealing with fine wine and watching the developments of a lot of categories around the world uh, while also watching what's happening in the supermarkets and in the high street and in the mainstream but it, it is quite fascinating to see the past the present and then even think a little bit more about the future um, undoubtedly 
the old vine. I remember speaking at the White Blend Conference in 09 at uh, Forest 44, which Ian Nordia organized and with the Eben and a few other. And there was a massive crowd there. And it touched on a little early days of the old vine. It wasn't a main theme, but it, it was certainly touched on. And I think, as Ina says, and, and uh, Rosa will probably say, you know, 10, 11 years later, you know, those were, there was a lot of work being done, but it was a lot of behind the scenes work by people like Rosa. Um, but ultimately for us as, as retailers, we wanted to buy the best wines, sell the best wines, uh, if there was rarity and scarcity, that's fine. As long as we got an allocation, we would be happy. Um, so effectively, it was a marketing tool. But I have to say, uh, while things might be changing now and certainly going forward, in those days, the, the old vine mantra was recognized clearly among fine wine buyers for uh, ac across the world, whether it's old vine in Spain or in Burgundy or wherever, Bordeaux. Um, there was certainly a recognition, but we certainly used it up front to help promote producer stories and used it as ammunition for the producers. So the people who engaged early in that in this category, your Ibn Saadis, your Ian Nordias, your um, Chris Alheights, you know, we didn't make it at that very early stage just about old vines and this is what we, we interwove it into the message, into the story, into the vineyard story of those producers' wines. And uh, a lot of that halo effect came onto the old wine category, of course, but came full circle back to the producers. So these you know, producers at that time were trying to make benchmark wines and were you know, moving into new category. Of course, the young guns then started more one by one by one, started to kind of chip away and, and, and increase the pool of kind of rarities and little fine wine parcels. Um, but, you know, we are always going to be talking, I said, uh, is it Rico said, or, or, or maybe you said, Jonathan, we're talking about a premium category. It's, it's amazing what Victoria is doing with Waitrose. I think there's a lot of development that can be done there. And maybe that segment of the trade will be the one that answers Butch's concerns about quality in bottle and how do we make sure that the seal means something, that the quality is in the bottle, whether it's 15 pounds a bottle or 20 pounds a bottle or 60, 70 pounds a bottle. So I think as buyers, you know, we are always looking for quality. That is the number one consideration. Um, the other things that feed into that, the price, the packaging, the story, the producer, um, you know, are very important. But certainly quality for any good buyer will be utmost. So I think we are natural gatekeepers uh, of integrity there. So Chris, I don't think you need to worry too much. But I know um, now that, you know, where we are now, where, where Old Vine has certainly gone mainstream in many ways, the, the consumer looks at it certainly from our clientele, um, in, it's a premium market and you know I think this is where the product is these are expensive wines often or more expensive wines and it's you know it, it's a lot of people kind of deny or brush over what the benefits may be but then you find now these are people shifting volumes of five to ten pound wines and I, I mean they're never going to be the the crux the point of old vine these are going to always be the serious ones are going to be small parcels small lots uh, rarity value, collectible value, incredible quality, lauded, high scores, um, uh, kind of chased by collectors. And I, I don't really see that going away. What you, what you will see is some projects like Donnie's doing and like the um, Distel and a few, which are not even massive quantities, but slightly bigger uh, distribution coming through, which is only a good thing for the whole old wine category. But Certainly for us now, I think our customers see an undeniable quality benefits in Old Vine. Um, it's clear on the, uh, uh, what Astrid, you know, just coming back to Astrid, you know, the texture of the wines, uh, the mouthfeel of the wines, but also quite interestingly, the quality of Old Vine vineyards in difficult vintages uh, is elevated compared to younger vine vineyards in difficult years, drought years, poor years. So, that, so I think that, that becomes evident um, and the maturity of the vines, you know, they know what to do in those difficult years. Um, 
one, I think, quite important thing for the old vine category is it really does have a new resonance with um, the kind of millennial buyer who um, who have not grown up drinking old Bordeaux and old Burgundy because they haven't basically been able to afford it unless they've got uh, wealthy professional parents who had nice big sellers. Um, but effectively, the message of sustainability, um, good husbandry to the vineyards, um, looking after your heritage, um, but doing it all in a meaningful way, it really does resonate with a lot of consumers. And while we do have a lot of older, kind of more mature consumers, we are seeing a lot of our kind of, uh, after 31 years in business, our, those people, those consumers, our oldest customers, kind of kids who are young lawyers, young bankers, young professionals coming through and starting to appreciate um, and buy into uh, the categories that they've grown up on. And they really do have an extra resonance and a uh, following for the old vine category thanks, from thanks, South Africa as well as, as well as bro broader. Can, can we wrap up? Because I've got a question for you and Victoria from the audience. Um, yep. So if we can, thanks. Okay, I'll flick through my last couple of points. Um, um, I think we shouldn't be scared of the fragmentation issue. Um, like Burgundy, the greatest wines are probably the, the one barrel wines, the tiny production wines. Um, and as a category, it's, it can be a good thing because it does share a lot of halo onto the broader category of the 20 year old vines, the 25 year old vines that will be the future uh, of the old vine category. Um, um, so yeah, so finite, cat finite category segmentation, uh, halo. Um, and I think morally it's a good thing to do. And that has a resonance across a broader category with the producers and these wines, I know when I spoke to Butch, uh, when he was thinking of launching these new single vineyard wines, there was a bit of tendency, like, you know, putting all these new wine, you know, new products on the market. Um, and will there be enough uptake? Because it, it, technically it's a small category, but it's actually not such a small category when you think all the people like me who get quite big allocations of all these things actually sell out and don't have enough to retail effectively. Uh, most of them are offered on release because they have to, um, and most of them sell out on release. So having a little more volume where we can do our offers and a little bit more trickle through um, into the kind of mainstream retail, is, it will only be a good thing. So um, um, I think we're moving into the new phase, um, the future, the power. We can use the old vine category uh, with, without questioning what, what it's all about, or is there any worth and value? I think those are questions that have been answered a long time ago now. And we need to think about where we're we moving this uh, as a total category, how it can have the maximum halo effect for the South African industry as a whole, for even for bigger producers and people producing younger vines. And if that's an element that comes from the good husbandry side of, of looking after vines and a good moral side, then so be it. And then that can filter more into the high street and the supermarkets as well. But um, the packaging, the story, the quality. I mean, it, it's resonated and it's been very successful. So um, I hope that all makes sense from uh, the premium, okay. side, premium side of the category. But these are mostly, if not all, almost you know, premium products. So uh, they've been very successful. Thanks, Greg. Really, really um, great insights. And interesting what you're saying about transcendent value. Um, that moral value that it speaks to, really interesting comment. I really, uh, really like that. Um, so then just finally, uh, from Francois Rotenbach, who, who runs the wine program for Singita. Um, uh, maybe some of you have had the privilege of staying there. But just, Francois, to share just briefly um, how to educate consumers in, 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 in the on-trade. So welcome, um, Francois. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you. And hello to everybody else. And uh, just a brief but really heartfelt uh, thank you very much to Andre and Rosa and then the greater collective of farmers, etc., wine producers, because this has been an amazing journey. And I think it's really growing from strength to strength. Um, our experience is that it is a very vital component of uh, what is developing within South Africa's branding. Uh, and it's because of Things like quality, authenticity, integrity, it's the words that have been used earlier in the day, uh, but they really are 
critical things. Uh, there are a number of uh, international people and it's, it's, it is small, but it is in fact growing in many respects. And many of them have been looking for what places South Africa in a different place. Uh, if I'm investing in Burgundy or I'm enjoying Bordeaux, what am I seeking it from South Africa that would be able to compete in terms of interest? And the, the broader OVP category has become a real draw card there. But it comes down to a tremendous amount of education. And uh, we've certainly embraced that at Sangeeta. And we've seen a, a huge amount of positivity coming from that. It's a progressive thing. It doesn't happen overnight. But I think there, there's, it, it's a multi-layered, it's an emotional uh, touch point for many uh, of our guests, international visitors, etc., cetera, because it covers more than just the wine itself, not just the intrinsics in the bottle, extrinsics, but this component of the stories going right down to the workers and the farmers, and in particular, the environment related to that, that sustainability of all of it is an enormous draw card. And it's a real uh, attention grabber because it transcends people feeling intimidated by fine wine or feeling intimidated by flavors and characters they're unfamiliar with. And it becomes a, a positively exciting exploratory thing. So really powerful in that sense. And uh, the, the interesting thing for us is that when guests are visiting us, uh, we offer all of these wines within the rates. So on the one hand, you could always argue, well, they're saying these are fantastic, very exciting, but it didn't cost them anything. But then the extraordinary thing is when people turn around uh, during their stay or come back and back um, over time and say, we want to get our hands on this wine to be able to enjoy at home, share with our friends, whether those be home friends or whether they be associates in the business place. And I think that's where the real differentiator comes in. When people are saying, this is a value point, this makes a difference in my life. And where that I think becomes even more important is we are seeing more and more signs that millennials, post millennials, as Greg uh, touched on, are shifting in their interests. Uh, they perhaps no longer that interested in multiple times of new oak or even things like gravity fed cellars and the tallest seller or the highest seller etc those are all different marketing things um, be they fact or fiction that have come through over time and they're looking for new things and we've seen some real interest developing from young people who um, as greg said the next generations that are coming through are no longer wanting to follow their parents' example of the same particular wines, but they want to follow that example of being able to get hold of wines that they can enjoy and share, and also over time. As we already know, a lot of these old vine wines are naturally suited to maturing and developing even further textures and flavors and characters. So there is real opportunity there. Um, and we, we see that in terms of Guests wanting to join into wine tastings, they want to converse about it, and it goes beyond just the actual stay. It's an, an ongoing, there's a sustained component to it, and they really want to get under the skin of it, um, even if they initially don't really understand what it's all about. I think that's the fascinating thing because it's so multifaceted. Um, but I would warn, and I think it's an important warning to provide to follow very much in what Chris has said and, and a number of the other panelists. And that is that these new generations and interestingly enough, the existing fine wine investors are becoming more and more sensitive to the authenticity of these stories. So the stories they're embracing, but then they really want to know, is this premium price I'm paying really gonna make a difference to the farm worker, the farm owner, um, it's got to go beyond just that sort of feel good factor. They actually want to know that there's a real difference. We've seen this with guests of ours who have been invested uh, in Sangeeta beyond their stay, where they are really wanting to be involved in the conservation. And in that sense, there's real opportunities for uh, international people wanting to be more involved than just literally consuming the wine. And so, 
that warning, if it's managed well, uh, and I know Andre is working on things like that and, and uh, numerous other people, but it is particularly important um, to, to keep that in mind. And it, it draws through this thing of um, the sustainability, not just of the environment component, but of the whole project. We've got this wonderful benefit because it's largely first out of the blocks in terms of having the uh, seal. And I think that heritage seal becomes really critical within those contexts, as Victoria mentioned, et cetera. Uh, it's part of the education work that we're doing in terms of um, really showcasing it and um, helping everyone to understand what it means, what it signifies and where that premium relates to. So I would encourage, be consistent where it's placed, how it's placed, very important. And then that uh, draw through so that um, what we're saying, uh, the international customers and local customers really feel that there's a tangible difference that uh, all of us are making. So really critical there. Thanks, Francois. Can, can I, I wrap up? Can I, I've just got a... Yeah, can what I just add one very very quick point to yes, um, so this sure. authenticity? So we've, we've talked about where we've come from, where we are now, and where we think things are leading. But, um, you know, I think coming back to one of the points I, I, I dipped in on earlier about the recognition of the category and the recognition of growers, um, you know, ultimately, these have been the custodians over generations. But when these people are gone, um, these vineyard sites... Um, I mean, I don't know about Skirberg and, you know, you know, all these places, the, these vineyards take on a personality of their own. They take on a brand of their own, just like it does in Burgundy or in Bordeaux. Um, and whether those vineyards, some of them are pulled up one day, if, you know, one of the legacies of the old vine will be, you know, preparing the next generation of old vine and that's obviously rose is doing a lot of that with 20 30 uh, 25 you know uh, the future old vines and and that's also been a, a great benefit but certainly i think there's a lot more that you can be tied in between the growers who are still around now and where they will be uh, who the next generation of those growers will be and giving them the recognition they deserve i know tim's done a bit a lot of that in his uh, south african reports but um it, it is an important thing because ultimately the, the next step is those vineyards um, and the establishing of what those blocks are, where they are, what they're called. Um, you know, some people may call for classification of vineyards. And I think that's a long, long, long way away for the specific vineyards. But certainly the brands themselves, um, if you take the obvious one, Skirfberg, there's several growers there. There's, several, there's many vineyards there. Uh, most of them are old vine. I don't know if Butch can just add if they're all old vine or if there's new plantings there. That, but I, presumably, if, if these vines, it's not just about the that the vines are old. There, there, there is an intrinsic quality in that site uh, that has now been established and the style. So I think that is certainly something that will resonate in future stories. Because certainly some of these vineyards are going to have to be pulled up eventually. They're not going to go forever. And um, if if you can say this is a a young five, six-year-old vineyard in, from the Skirfberg, people would go, wow, yeah, I used to, you know, I, I, I buy a lot of the kind of old vine stuff. You know, that's a whole nother kind of category that will have been spawned by the old vine project and, and, and the future, you know, where those vineyards are going to be in 20, 30, 40 years time. So um, it, 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 it just kind of opens every door you close, another one open, another two open. So it's, it's a lot to think about. So I think that's very exciting. Yeah. Th thanks, Greg. Um, Victoria, I've got a question here, and maybe Greg can just segue into this um, uh, as well. Uh, uh, Julian, I asked, uh, could Victoria or Greg on, uh, comment on the experience of, of similar heritage labeling from other countries? Um, and uh, I mean, does this really give South Africa a strong competitive advantage as a country brand? Um, Victoria, maybe you can start off on that. 
Um, okay, so I'll start with saying that my buying experience is quite limited to South Africa. So I've been a buyer for four years and I've been buying South African wines and other wines in that time. So in, to my knowledge, at least, there is not another certification um, which is uh, which validates the age of a vineyard in the industry. So while labels, uh, and please correct me if, if I'm wrong, but wh while there are labels out there which may make claims, Bavine or or they'll even say old vine on the front label these claims are not substantiated um and so they're much more them it's just a marketing message rather than an actual um uh, credible certification so i don't have i don't have any examples to draw on um but it's one of the reasons why i see this as a unique point a selling point for south africa specifically um and certainly within my range um maybe greg has a bit bit more um to add to that yeah, I mean, I, I can't off the top of my head think of anything that's comparable. I mean, I know that a lot of mimicking has come, which is not a bad thing. You know, it's the greatest form of flattery, you know, in Argentina and Chile. Uh, from that, they do have quite a bit of old vines, and especially down south in Bia Bia and Itata. And, you know, and they're kind of doing, you know, concrete egg and uh, um, amphora and uh, all this kind of thing with older vines. But... Um, it it, it 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 kind of adds to the story, but you know it has to be real and it has to certainly have authenticity. And I've you know having long discussions with Andre about how the old vine heritage stamps and uh, seals can be rolled out globally. I mean, it's it's certainly a massive thing, and I know a lot of work's been done and a lot of planning's been done. Um, so why we why not be the leader we we are the leader in this category and uh, we're the one who's taken the uh you know the jump on it so let's roll it out and let's get the the let's get uh our framework over in chile let's get it over in australia let's get it over to uh, the rest of the new world and um I, d I think it'll be a hard one to adopt in many uh, old world countries spain might be quite keen i think but um certainly france you know a lot of them will just kind of roll their shoulders and roll their eyes and say, well, it's, it's, it, you know, our wines are more important, you know, the, 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 the 900 years of Burgundy kind of thing. But I think there's still a lot to roll out, certainly in New Zealand, Australia, Spain and South America. And that would only add to our kind of old vine category significance and strength. So that, um, it's great to be a leader there. Thank, thank you, Greg. Really appreciate it. Jonathan, can I? It's very insightful. Yes, Just absolutely. Quickly, pop in there and um, just to wrap up on my end um i would certainly support both greg and um others in in the sense if you think about uh, radio lazarus when it was announced that that was finally coming to a genuine end um there was a lot of heartfelt pain in a sense and uh, if that was to be um re-energized in in the future uh, there would be some exciting things um to come from that, I think, in terms of excitement as to a rebirth. Uh, so there is definitely those kind of things. I think I would encourage that this uh, pasture, as you uh, mentioned, Jonathan, gets um, discussed even more. I think there's a, a hang of a lot that we can work through on this. So uh, I would encourage that. And the other part is I would really encourage the collateral from the producers and the farmers, etc. those stories we talk about, the more we can get of that, uh, the, the better, um, because I think it, it uh, is, is the tangible components that the international buyers uh, would be really interested to see and understand. And then the last thought, uh, we're very concerned about the farmers and the workers, etc., and their sustainability. The other part is that we need to make sure that the Olvan project itself is sustainable. So I think that's worth a conversation for the future as well. Because uh, I know there's a lot of work being done, hours being put in, and we just need to make sure that that can continue for the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Francois. Um, and so just to round off our discussion, there's a, been a very uh, important question. And, um, you know, I sent Rosa um, T.S. Eliot poem, which is my favorite, which says, we shall not cease from exploration at the end of all our exploring will be a to, to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So I think it's important for us to then uh, start off where it all began with Rosa. And I have a question from 
uh, Anthony Hamilton Russell, and then I'd like to just finish off with a snap from from David. Um, so Anthony uh, Hamilton Russell asked uh, about. Uh, I gather there are a couple of unvirused old vine vineyards in the Cedarburg, but what percentage of the remaining old vine vineyards in the country are free of leaf roll? And it made me also think about whether there's a superimposition that people have with vine age and low yields and whether that's maybe uh, there's the, in, the intervention of virus also has, a, has uh, something to do with that. Rosa, you want to, uh, you want to comment? Just unmute yeah. yourself. Unmute, yeah. Uh, Rosa, Rosa, unmute. Unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, yes. Thank you, Greg and uh, Francois and Victoria, so much for your comments. It's really, really highly appreciated. Fantastic to think where we start and where we're at now. I'll keep it short, but it's a very important question that um, Anthony Hamilton Russell, Russell asked about the unvirus and the influence of virus. Through the Shannon um, Association and Ina's work, Inter Luar, that's a nursery in, in uh, came to South Africa. They tested some of our, our oldest Shannon vineyards and they found three vineyards. They tested, I think it was, if I remember correctly, Ina it was about 14 different vineyards. They found three that's clean, four that's clean of virus. Those four were planted 1956, 57, and 62, something like that. And Nadia gave me the figures. Thank you, Nadia. Um, now, why they cleaned? That is the most important question. The, we know that the um, leaf roll virus is spread by the vector mealybug more important than anything else. Um, but what is the chance of those vineyards being clean for the last 60 years? On Nico Spirit, the previous um, chief in charge of Vititech, we had a long discussion about this. And I said to him, maybe, just maybe we have genetically resistant material, um, material resist resistant to virus in, this, in South Africa. And he said, Rosa, you know, you are a little, always a little bit too romantic, which might be totally true. But you know, that's how the Old Vineyard Project started with, with romantic ideas. So we, they tested it and it's clean. Now everybody says to me, but there's no millibug in, in uh, uh, Skirfberg, and it's not Cedarburg, it's all Skirfberg, thank you, Anthony. So, but there's one vineyard in Pekinish Kloof that was also tested clean, planted in 1962, as almost as old as I am, or actually younger than me. So, and I know that vineyard because I've, I helped the farmers farm those vineyards, and I know there's millibug there. So why are some vineyards clean? We don't know. I would love a list of PhD students to jump onto that because if it's true that this in the, and that's what I've always said, the old vine project can lead so much research in terms of vines and the way vines grow old. That it, we can, it, there's so much um, knowledge inherent in old vines. Um, that's the point I wanted to make about that, and then I hope it helps you. The expression of different soils seem to express virus differently. The heavier soils, like red clay, seem to express more heavily. The sandier soil seems to express less heavily. Uh, Chris Arnott, you would know in Skirpat, there's virus in uh, some of those, um, uh, especially that one pinotage vineyard of Hank Lang. But I have a 120 year old Sinsa vineyard that has virus, but it's very slightly expressed and it's planted on an old riverbed and planted on sandy soils. So we should research that as well. Why does it express differently in different sites? And is the quality good because it's low yield, because it's virus? No, I think it's absolute nonsense. The quality is good because of the memory caught up in the reserves of the wood. Um, we have old vines that yield high. We have old vines that gives us 16, 18, 20, 25 tons a hectare, which is not always, of course, quality wines. But um, it's not always the case that young that old vines uh, have low yields. 
But before you stop me, I just want to say one more thing. Um, the good, someone mentioned the good moral side. The good moral side is very important to me always. And we have to look after the training of our new workers. I think I've said this how many times, Andre? Have I said it over the years? <laughs> Maybe a hundred times. But we need, I need to get funding at some stage for the old one project to train our farm workers. It's, we talk about the value chain. Greg, you talked, and uh, Victoria, you spoke about the value chain. It's fantastic. Everyone is benefiting, but the farm workers also benefit from this. We must train our farm workers. We must make them proud of what they do, which they already are. Let's, let me freeze, rephrase that. We must give them more knowledge and understanding of what they are doing. That is one thing I'm totally committed to. And I always will be. And I really think that is a part of the old line project that we will try to expand to in future. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you very much. Um, I think that point is well taken. And certainly this idea about transcendent value, um, doing a, quite a bit of uh, consumer research on, on old vines. And uh, that, that moral, uh, speaking to the moral compass is a really, really valid uh, point that Greg and Rosa have made. So, so great. Thanks for making that point. I just want to get a quick uh, uh, perspective from D David Saadi, and then we're going to wrap up for today. That's unfortunately all we have time for. I always knew we were going to run over time because people are really passionate about this. So D David, you want to just say, um, make a comment here to round off? I think I spoke earlier about uh, authenticity and credibility of the seal, and I think it goes hand in hand with um, with quality. I think the reality of having 90,000 hectares in our, in our country is, first of all, to have a cultural change from um, upkeeping to interplant to look at the hygiene of how we prune. Um, and I, I mean, speaking about training in, in, in all aspects of farming, the training is relevant to make sure these vines become old. And the reality is that what I've summarized as well is that if we have, say, 3,000 hectares of old vines at the moment, we need to get those vines, uh, the vineyards of the grapes into a bottle. Um, so I think the quality aspect versus price point versus if it's only fine wine, um, I think it's important to have those discussions to make sure that we can get all the hectares we can into a bottle and in a way not to worry about the fact that it might dilute the brand. Um, I think it's important to have more old vine project bottles being sold and consumed around the world than not. Um, obviously, if you think of a crew or a qualification system or a, a demarcation system, uh, quality will always prevail in terms of fine wine and collectors around that. But uh, the most important part of it is that we need to also think of, of the fact that we have 3,000 at least and then a potential another 87,000 hectares that we need to look after. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I think that's it from, from our side. There's, there's just so much to discuss. And so these are pretty broad strokes, I think, between the last session and this session to really try and paint the picture and, and identify um, uh, topics that we can there, then go and dive a little bit deeper into. And I think we, we, we've, we've, we've kind of got there. Um, but maybe just to round off the discussion to have a final word from uh, my co-host, uh, Andre Morgenthal, just to round off our discussion and then maybe tell you a little bit about what we, we might be up to in the future. Andre? Jonathan, thank you very much. And uh, I think um, rounding it off um, is insufficient. We've uh, everybody's spoken so well. Um, uh, we are so proud of, of uh, the Old Vine Project and our members. Um, I would just like to thank our panel members this afternoon. Uh, many of you, um, as I said last time as well, I sit and we talk for hours how to make this work. And I appreciate your time and your passion and your input. Um, thank you for this afternoon. Um, special thanks to Jonathan um, for facilitating this and Lorraine uh, for your input. Um, Raf and Nadia in the background. Um, Rosa, our mentor that keeps things uh, uh, <laughs> on even keel. <laughs> um, and I think uh, what's 
what's apparent now is going forward is the business model. So our next session is going to be a proper uh, uh, academic uh, session around the business model for the Old Vine project and to make this work. Um, so we look forward to seeing you uh, and contributing as well. Have a great weekend and thank you to everyone that contributed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre, and thank you uh, again to Lorraine. Um, uh, you know, she had a lot more to say last week, so she's happy to just help facilitate. But as I said, this started off as wanting to educate our students and has grown into something far larger and, and wonderful. So um, I'd like to really thank everybody for being here. I really appreciate your time. And hopefully it's been of value to our our audience, and, and should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send, send us those questions, and I'm sure we can help to answer them. So thank you, and wishing you a wonderful weekend. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to next week where I can stock up on, on my, my cellar, which is, uh, is, is taking a beating. So take care, everybody, and, and, and have a wonderful weekend.